Okay, um, good evening and welcome to tonight and we've come here to discuss the written word in an oral world. The talks tonight are presented by the Centre for Global Mission and this centre aims to support Christian organisations worldwide by providing Bible-based theological training resources to prepare leaders in their context. And my name is Marinka and since studying here at Moore College, my husband and I have been working in southwest Sydney. We've been sharing Jesus amongst a large Arab Muslim community. So tonight's topic, the written word in an oral world, is of particular interest to me. Um, I remember sitting with a passionate Muslim friend in our kitchen and we were reading Genesis 1 and 2 together. And I was expecting her to share from her holy book as well. But instead, she wanted to show me YouTube videos of Islamic leaders. And this got me thinking. The way that we wanted to share information about our faiths was really different. And it made me wonder what assumptions um, to do with text-based learning was I bringing into my ministry. Of course, evangelical Christians are rightly insistent on being people of the word. It's living and active, creative and sustaining. God brings salvation and new life to all who believe his word, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible is God's word in written form, so naturally it's right to make sure that the Bible is at the centre of our life and ministry. And what a liberating blessing it was when the printing press was invented and for the first time in history, ordinary individuals got to access the Bibles for themselves and increasingly in their own language. It's right that translation and the distribution of God's word in as many languages as possible is one of our highest priorities in global mission. But do we too easily make the assumption that being committed to the word of God is the same thing as reading the Bible ourselves? What does that mean for oral learners? Interestingly, 44% of Australian adults don't have sufficient literacy to cope with everyday demands in life and work. And so tonight is a really important conversation about what it might look like to hold on to the power of God's word while communicating the gospel effectively with oral learners. Tonight um, is divided into three sections. Firstly, Dr. Simon Gillam, the head of mission here at Moore College, will be looking at what the Bible says about the ministry of the Word of God. After that, Bishop Malcolm Williams, sorry, Malcolm Richards, the director of the Centre for Global Mission, will be exploring how we can love oral preference learners in our churches. Lastly, we've set aside some time for a panel discussion, so you can send questions in, and I think we're taking questions from the floor here as well. Uh, we're using Slido, which is on the screen. Um, you can text your questions in um, at any point during the talks. Before I hand over to Simon, I'm going to pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for, your, for the gospel, your words of eternal life. We ask for wisdom and humility as we think tonight about how we can share this saving news with others. In Jesus' precious, precious name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks, Marinka, and welcome, everybody. Uh, tonight, I want to work briefly uh, with you to understand what the Bible says about reading the Word of God. My hope is that we're going to realise afresh that while there's a clear expectation that the leaders of God's people are going to be readers of his word, this is not a baseline expectation for all who follow Jesus. This realisation, I hope, uh, will help us to develop additional models of ministry, ministry of the word that do not assume literacy. So that's the goal. Uh, but I want you to work hard with me. We're going to step our way through the Bible very quickly. Um, but we'll start at the start, which is a very good place to begin. Uh, in the creation, we see that God spoke creation into being. Uh, 
Uh, We worship and serve a speaking God and his word is to be trusted and obeyed. As Adam walked into the garden, and he heard from God directly. Uh, Following God should have been easy and obvious for him, but of course we're familiar with the catastrophe uh, of the fall as God's word was questioned, doubted, distorted and disobeyed. After the fall, uh, however, God continued to speak audibly to the patriarchs, Abraham primarily, and to a lesser extent to Isaac and then a little bit more to Jacob. From the heart of the Egyptian captivity, God addressed Moses personally and extensively. And Moses was a mediator between God and the now nation of Israel. At Sinai, God spoke his law to Moses and gave it to him to give to the people. And that point marked a monumental transition in the relationship between God and his people. While the generations had preserved the stories of God's dealings with the patriarchs orally, for the first time, God's word was preserved in written form. Not just the two stone tablets, but in time, the Book of the Covenant, the whole law. We're going to focus in a little bit for a few moments on Deuteronomy as we think about the relationship of the people of God to his written word. So as Moses addressed the second generation of the Exodus, at the end of the wanderings, on the verge of the promised land, he gives instructions about what they were to do with the law they'd been given. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. You see, the people are to recite, discuss, commit to memory the commandments of God throughout their everyday lives. The law was to be bound both to them and to their homes, inseparable from them. Meditation on scripture in this model was to happen primarily in the households, in the families of God's uh, people, the families of the nation. As questions are raised and answered in the retelling of the great acts of salvation. The Levitical priests did have a unique and a crucial role in also preserving and passing on the law of God. They were to pass the book on to the king who was to write out uh, his own copy. In the Old Testament, in fact, it's only the Levites, the priests, the elders and the kings who were expected to read the word. Uh, We hear the description of how the whole nation should have been guided by this. In Deuteronomy 31. So Moses wrote down this law and gave it to the Levitical priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years in the year for cancelling debts during the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose, you shall read this law before them in their hearing. And those who were to uh, to be taught the law included Israelite men, women and children, but also the foreigners living in the community. The Levitical priests, the religious leaders and the elders, the civic leaders of the nation, bore responsibility together for seeing that this happened. They were to read the law so that the oral transmission of the last seven years could be checked against the word read. They were to read it as the people gathered together. See, for the nation of Israel, religion was not an entirely private matter. And the relationship with God is not a private matter. God created a people for himself, not just a collection of individuals. And the law being read out to the community gathered is part of the dynamic of how God was speaking to his people. And for that reason, the hearing and the reflecting on the covenant was most appropriately a corporate activity as well. 
As Moses neared the end of his life, Deuteronomy records the preparation uh, for the nation um, for a succession in human leadership. And a shift in expectations came about then for how people would hear God speak um, after Moses had gone. Joshua had been Moses' long-serving aide. He'd stayed at the tent of meeting. He'd explored the land and reported faithfully uh, about it. He'd, given the, uh, he'd been given the responsibility with Eleazar of allocating out the land. And he'd now been identified and commissioned as Moses' successor. But there was a very clear distinction between Moses and Joshua. And indeed between Moses and and all later prophets as well. See, Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? The Israelites listened to Joshua and did what Moses said. Have you ever had a conversation with your children like that? Where they listen to you but do what somebody else says? It's Moses that is obeyed. It's Moses' word that is authoritative. But Moses is now dead. How is this possible? It's the written word. It's the word that's that's passed on. Um, Joshua did not replace Moses as a mediator. Um, The new mediators, uh, the, the new leaders were not new mediators bringing a new revelation from God. They were to faithfully pass on what Moses had said, to constantly refer back in time to the law that was then written. The exception to this rule would be a prophet like Moses that Yahweh would raise up to speak for him. But at the time Deuteronomy was written, still no such prophet had arisen. Now, given that a prophet spoke with the authority of God, it was critical that the nation was going to be able to distinguish between a true prophet and a false one. Uh, So Moses gave them the test. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord, Deuteronomy 18, does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, so do not be alarmed. Now, for most of my Christian life, I took it that that was one criterion for testing prophecy. You just wait to see if it comes true or not. And if it comes true, they're a true prophet. If it doesn't, they're a false prophet. But can you see the problem with that as being a test? I mean, apart from the fact that the vast majority of what the prophets wrote was not predictive, so there's nothing to check, even if it was predictive, it might actually take hundreds of years for that thing to come about. Not much of a test, really, is it? What do you do in the hundreds of years in the meantime? Well, in fact, it's not just one test. There are two tests. There are two tests embedded here. The second criterion is harder to see in our Indridge translations, but take place and come true are not two ways of saying the same thing. Uh, The first one is predictive, see that it takes place, but the second one is better to see uh, as something like not being true not being sound. How could the nation tell if what the prophet said was true? There was a measure by which they had to assess that. That was the revelation which had already been given. What the prophets said had to be in line with what God had already said. And so the true prophets consistently call people back to the covenant, remind them of what they should have already known. False prophets multiplied in the lead-up to the exile, proclaiming peace when there was no peace and not reminding people of the salvation that God had brought, had delivered. Now, that situation led to a a tremendous damage 
um, in the nation's view of prophecy in the lead-up to the exile and throughout the exile. But perhaps surprisingly, during this time, the writings of the prophets became more highly valued. Um, They were collected, they were preserved, uh, and particularly after the exile, people reflected on these true prophets who spoke truly about what actually did happen in the exile. And that process um, uh, of the accuracy of their words, the legitimacy of their words being confirmed by the exile meant that the writings of the prophets continued to be elevated in the minds of ordinary um, uh, Jews, people of Judah. It led to their work being revered as the word of God and explains why by the time of Jesus scribal teaching about the written word had risen to prominence really to replace prophecy as the expected mode of God's self-revelation. That was a transition that took place. The third division of books in the Hebrew Bible um, is the writings, and I'm not going to pretend to do justice to this whole uh, corpus. In fact, I just want to say one thing about the writings, or one point about the writings, in fact, about the Psalms, which is relevant to our discussion, particularly of orality. The Psalms and many other parts of the Old Testament are written to be sung, and by and large to be sung by whole communities, to be sung together. In our highly literate churches, we tend to default to reading psalms if we make any use of them at all. But reading the psalms and singing them corporately is not the same thing. And it's especially not the same thing for the less literate amongst us. Indeed, the very nature of either singing or listening to singing uh, does at least three additional things which are important for those Um, who struggle with literacy. Singing helps to integrate cognition, emotion and experience. It involves more than the words that are being rehearsed, more than the world of ideas, uh, but it helps our knowledge of God to be integrated into transformed lives. There's a social power, secondly, uh, in corporate singing that binds a group of individuals together in a new shared experience such that their solidarity with one another is in, enhanced in the act of singing this, sing, this thing together. And thirdly, music powerfully enhances memory. So the Psalms function both to remind the people of the past, but also to in themselves, in the rehearsing of them, be memorable and repeatable. So the form of the Psalms as poetry, but even more as poetry to be sung, makes them particularly well-suited for those who are less literate to learn and preserve the Word of God. Sliding oh so quickly, ever so quickly, too quickly into the New Testament and getting to Jesus. You know, the only people in the Bible that I can find rebuked for not reading the Word of God are people rebuked by Jesus. It's the scribes and the Pharisees. And Jesus confronts them in each of the gospel accounts. In most interactions, when Jesus engages with the written word of God, he informs his hearers of what is written or of what was said or of what they had heard was said. But when he's talking to the scribes, the Pharisees, the the leaders, he says, have you not read? What's wrong with you? You've not done your job. More pointedly, they should have recognised what the Scriptures said about him. Jesus taught that it was impossible to understand the Old Testament rightly unless it was understood to be pointing to him. And you can check up later Luke 24 um, or John 5, which you see on the screen now. In the Sermon on the Mount, we have perhaps the clearest example of Jesus self-consciously and explicitly raising his own spoken words to the status of the written word of God in that series 
uh, of you have heard it said, but now I tell you statements, Matthew 5. Builds to the climax of his final assertion in chapter 7 at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that the wise person is the one who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. All of the accounts of Jesus' life and teaching were certainly preserved orally in the first instance. But Luke wrote his orderly account so that others might know the certainty of the things that they had been taught. And John wrote his account so that others who did not see um, Jesus or see what Jesus had done might yet believe that he is the Messiah and that by believing might have life in his name. It's the purpose of the writing. Now, in this context, I'm not going to take um, any time to rehearse the arguments uh, for the apostolic writings qualifying as inspired scripture. I, I just want to note together with you that this witness began and was initially preserved orally before the rapid expansion of the church, uh, but quite quickly it motivated the apostles to keep in contact with the early church in written form. That form of communication uh, became uh, vital and important, particularly in preserving and then propagating the true faith. Those letters were to be read and taught alongside the law, the prophets and the writings. So Justin Martyr's famous description of the second century church illustrates this well. On the day called Sunday, all who live in the cities and the country gather together to one place and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. Then when the reader has ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the, imita uh, to the imitation of these good things. In this sense, the command to Timothy functions as, uh, as the model or the instruction to all leaders in the church. Paul wrote, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. And that's what we see in Justin's letter. The New Testament letters themselves were expected to be read over repeatedly, copied, passed around. The Bereans are commended as model believers because they carefully examined the Scriptures. Now, I've got to say, it's so easy to read that and think, oh, they carefully examine the Scriptures. In your head, what's the picture look like? Is it people sitting around with a Bible in front of them at their desk, on their own, carefully examining the Scriptures, right? That's what you're urged to do. But in a moment's reflection, you realise, don't you, that that would have been impossible for the Bereans? There's no way... That, that, would they have even had more than one copy? Probably not. How many could read? Possibly not many. And what's being described in any case is not a series of individuals looking over their own copy, but a church that gathers together and meditates on the Word of God together. It's their examination together which is commended here. The Scriptures read out loud together in a context of relationships that's the normal and expected pattern of scriptural engagement that we find in the Bible. For us, we live on this side of much higher levels of literacy. We have the ease and the relative low cost of being able to produce copies of scripture, which makes private reading a much more accessible and a much more common option than ever before. But just because it's possible or even easy doesn't necessarily mean that it's always better. We certainly should be cautious of assuming that when the New Testament talks about hearing Scripture publicly, that that's the same thing as reading it privately. I hope I've just thrown up lots of questions for you. Let me, please just indulge me with a word of personal testimony uh, as I finish today. When I read the Bible in church, I'm in control. 
I do it at my own pace. There might be a person up the front who's also reading the passage, but I'm there with my Bible. I'm reading at my pace. And if there's a bit that I miss, I'll go back to it. And if I drift off, well, I'll pick up my pace. And it doesn't matter what pace the person out the front is reading, I'll get to the end when I get to the end. Do you read the Bible like that in church? You've got your own copy. You're doing it at your own pace. And the person at the front may or may not have any impact on that experience for you at all. That's certainly been my experience. But if I don't read, if I sit there and listen, I am at the mercy of the person who is reading. I actually have to concentrate to engage to stay with them. The relational dynamic of what's going on is quite different for me. My attention is limited to the portion of the Bible that is being read out for me. We are doing this together. And I've been surprised at how profoundly different that experience is for me in church, to sit and read or to sit and listen. Um, And I'm not saying that we should always do one or the other or that one's evil or anything like that. I just want to say they're not the same. They're not the same thing. And the Bible is encouraging us to one thing. And that another is possible doesn't mean that it's necessarily better. And as a person like me, who's immersed in a hyper-individualistic culture, who's used to assuming the highest levels of personal autonomy that you can generate for yourself, I find it a good and healthy thing to push back against that, to work harder at hearing the Word of God in the fellowship of other believers. And I wonder if that might be something that you find helpful too. I can't imagine you'll have any questions, but if there are, we'll deal with them at the end. Thanks, Brinka. So, Malcolm, we're considering how to train oral preference learners to use the written word of God to minister the gospel. Who are we training? Well, these people are just like any other godly, committed Christians who want to do gospel ministry. It's just that instead of being used to taking learning by taking notes and reading, they're used to learning in other ways. Okay. So they're oral learners, but they do read their Bibles, right? Well, a lot of oral preference learners, as we call them, are formally literate, and many of them would read. Uh, It's a matter of their learning style. So... As oral preference learners, they don't learn by reading and taking notes. They learn in other ways. Okay, but if they're oral preference learners in an oral culture, why don't we just give them audio Bibles and send them out? Well, audio Bibles and the written word of God are both the Bible. But from experience, we've seen that When people come to study the Bible in a Bible school, they actually expect to be be taught how to access the written word of God. Not only that, but churches expect people to be able to, to read the word of God and to access it if they're their leaders. But I think there is also an important educational element involved, and that is the written word of God as opposed to the oral word of God, allows much deeper and closer learning than is possible with the oral word of God. So the written word of God is what we need for deeper learning. Okay, so we're developing Bible basics. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is? So in Bible basics, we're assuming that our audience are oral preference learners. And our aim is to train church leaders for oral preference cultures to be able to read the Bible, understand the Bible, and teach the Bible to other people. But in order to teach them, we have to develop another set of strategies and learning principles so that they can learn. So, Gordon... In Bible Basics, we're on about uh, strategies for teaching oral learners. What 
learning and teaching strategies are we using currently in Bible Basics? I've had to rethink everything about teaching, Malcolm. But let me tell you four things that we're doing a lot of. Um, first is we have to keep everything highly relevant and practical. So it's more like we have the theory behind it, but we start out with the practice. How to preach a sermon, how to exegete a passage, how to minister to the bereaved, um, how to lead a Bible study, how to run meetings in a church. Second, we remind people of the big goals of the whole training package, uh, each subject, each lesson, beginning throughout and again at the end, because like any learner, they appreciate knowing why they're learning something and what the practical outcome is. Third is the skills. Um, we train them in the skills in class. The teacher might do one or two worked examples and show them how it's done. And then maybe a partially worked example, but lead the learners through it. And the learners contribute and they see the steps and do it themselves. And then finally, a handful of examples to the students. And they work it either in teams or individually with coaching from their uh, teacher, trainer, tutor. Finally, we're using a lot of groups. Research shows that oral preference learners often pre pre prefer a communal situation. Uh, they can fill in each other's gaps, they can sharpen each other, they can lean into each other's strengths, and they can work together to come up with answers, reinforcing what they know and making it even more real to them. So to finish up, I guess people uh, watching this want to know where we're up to in our project. Well, we've spent some time working out exactly our techniques, our strategies, our methods. We've nearly completed our first whole unit of work, about to send that out for field testing, and then hopefully we can just start writing and writing. I was a young missionary with uh, Elizabeth in the late 80s in uh, what was called Zaire and is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I remember as a, a young missionary uh, going off to join a church service, a midweek church service in a slum. And what was happening is Christians uh, were gathering together and they did it most week mornings before they went off to do their jobs, whatever they were doing, and they'd get together to pray uh, and read the Bible uh, before they headed off. So I went along to this uh, slum uh, church service thing, and to my surprise, they followed the morning office, the weekly morning prayer service from the Anglican prayer book, in Congolese Swahili, of course. Together, they said the set prayers, they listened to the set Bible readings, and heard a short Bible talk. And as a young, keen, more college-trained uh, evangelical, I thought, how old-fashioned. Why follow a liturgy? Surely they could do better than that. And then someone quietly pointed out to me that the only person apart from me who was literate in the whole room was the person leading the service. And yet, everyone in the room had participated. They had said the prayers together. They had sung together. In fact, it became evident to me that the whole event was designed for people who couldn't read. And as a young missionary, this got my brain whizzing. But hang on, we're a religion of the word. What's it like being a Christian without being able to read the word? Hang on, can you mature as a Christian if you can't read God's word? How do you mature as a Christian if you can't read God's word by yourself? And how do people... Me, as I started, how am I to do word ministry with people who can't read? <laughs>
Well, in this short talk, we're going to think about what it means to be followers of Jesus committed to the Word of God and committed to doing word-based ministry to people that can't read or won't read or prefer not to read. So as we begin, let's be clear about some of the terminology we're using. And most of this terminology is what's currently being used in missiological writing and research. Let's then think about how people learn, text or oral. So far in uh, Simon's talk, in the video, in Marinka's introduction, we've heard words such as text preference learners. And by this we mean those whose primary way of learning is reading and writing. And then there's oral preference learners. They're actually a broad group and it's basically defined as anyone who isn't a text-based learner. Oral learners typically learn through a variety of means, listening to stories, watching theatre, participating in rituals. They learn from songs, poems, and all sorts of other non-written means. I guess you're already thinking, these days we could add watching movies, listening to Spotify, YouTube, podcasts, TikTok, Instagram, all oral means of learning. And here's the shocking bit. You see the statistic on the, on the overhead, on the screen. It's estimated that 70 to 80% of the world's population are oral preference learners. Well, who are these oral preference learners? It's helpful to realise that oral preference learners are put into two categories, two groups. There's uh, primary oral preference learners. These, what we mean by primary oral preference learners are those who can't read or that their literacy level is low enough so that it is difficult for them to easily access meaning from texts. So those who actually can't get information out of texts. But secondary oral preference learners are those who are able to read for meaning, but their preference for learning is oral learning. You see, many oral learners can read quite well, but they prefer to listen or watch or participate. They prefer oral learning rather than text-based learning. Many oral preference learners come from what you could term oral preference communities or oral preference cultures, where it's normal to learn in this oral way. And in many non-Western cultures, by far the majority of people in those cultures are oral preference learners, either primary oral learners or secondary oral learners. It may be obvious, but nevertheless less worth saying, that we're not talking about intelligence here. Oral learners, text-based learners, nothing to do with intelligence. Although it's interesting that mo many intelligence tests assume literacy. In Western cultures, with the rise of digital platforms, there is a growing culture of oral learning. And research suggests that for those under 40 years of age, there may be a couple in the room, the majority are oral preference learners. If these stats are correct for Australia, that means people in your church and in this theological college are oral preference learners, and lots of them. 
Well, let's start thinking about patterns of ministry for text-based learners and oral learners. Let's look at how Christian cultures work, those with majority text preference learners and those with majority oral preference learners. So you see the screen. Uh, we have the group of people, they're in blue, and they're our text preference learners. And I suggest to you that uh, many Western evangelical subcult Christian subcultures are strongly text preference learning cultures. I'm happy for uh, people to challenge this in question time, but I want to suggest that many Western evangelical Christian cultures have some underlying presuppositions. And Simon talked about some of them in his talk. For a start, I think that we assume that this, the scriptures are available, that the Bible is both in a language that we can read, but also that there, it is in sufficient numbers that it's easy for people to get a hold of. So we pretty well assume that every Christian will have their own Bible and they're going to read it. Our second assumption is all our Christians, we assume, are quite literate and have the skills actually to analyse the text and to do comprehension. That is, whether we realise it or not, in many of the ways we do ministry, we assume that our people are text preference learners. We'll talk a bit more about this, but just think for a moment about what I believe is another one of our assumptions, and that is that development of spiritual maturity comes from the individual reading of scriptures and from reading Christian books. So that's our set of assumptions. Now, I want to suggest to you that uh, what we're doing as we train people for ministry is what we want to do is take some people out of our cohort of text preference learners in our churches and we want them to get greater access and greater a level of biblical literacy. Uh, we want them to be able to read the Bible and understand the Bible well. And so we give them all sorts of skills in understanding the written word. But what do we do when we're actually doing ministry? Let's have the next slide. What we often do in uh, local ministry, this may be a generalisation, but our ministry tends to be shaped by text-based learning strategies. We take what we learn in theological college and we tend to use similar strategies in ministry. Text-based Bible studies, reading the Bible with someone, text-based sermons and teaching. We assume this high level of literacy and that people are text-based learners. So in my diagram there, diagram one, B is basically equal to A. The way we're taught to access the scriptures, that's what we replicate in ministry as we teach the people in our churches. Now, I'm going to hold comment on this, but the observant will see the problem with this model, given that a large proportion of our people in our churches here are oral preference learners. Happy to talk about that later. Okay, what happens if we're working in an oral preference culture? Here we have the oral preference people in orange. The first thing I want to say is that I'm assuming, and I'm willing to defend this later, I talked about it a bit in the video we just saw, but I believe it's essential that some members of oral preference communities are given access to the written scriptures. 
The oral teaching that's going on in the oral preference community needs to be anchored in the scriptures. And so uh, we want to give some people in that community access. But as we take people from that oral preference community and give them greater biblical literacy skills, we're actually going to need a different set of learning and teaching strategies than we used with text-based and text-preference learners. We want the same outcome. We want uh, both text-based learners and oral preference learners to be able to read and understand God's word. But the way we're going to teach them in order to get to our objective will be different with those two groups. Same skills, different route. Now, here's the really critical thing that I want you to take away. As we have taught people from these oral preference learning communities to access the scriptures, when they go back to their communities and teach, we don't want them to use the same strategies that we use to teach them. They will be going to oral preference communities and will use all sorts of methods to teach and disciple their people, but their main methodologies will probably be oral strategies of one sort or another. So while we need one set of skills and strategies to teach our learners to read the Bible, we also have to teach them a different set of strategies to reach their people. You can see it's quite a significant difference, but an important difference. Well, in the last few minutes, I want to look at these two important sets of teaching and learning strategies with oral learners. C and D on our diagram there are different and distinct, but both important. Both the teaching of the leaders to access the written word and teaching those leaders how to teach their people. First of all, let's think of training oral preference learners for word ministry. That's what our video that you just saw before is about. Uh, you saw the video about Bible Basics. Bible Basics is a new resource being developed by uh, us at the Centre for Global Mission to teach oral preference learners how to access the Word of God. So uh, pray for us as we do that. I'm not going to say any more. You can ask questions later. I want to concentrate now as we finish with strategies for oral preference learners. So that was D, how the church leaders are then going to use the information they've learnt from the Bible to teach their people using uh, oral strategies. I want to divide my comments into two sections, lessons from history and lessons from current missionary practice. First of all, lessons from history. We know from history that wherever the gospel has gone, literacy rates have increased, especially once books were available. And it's right that Christians want to access the scripture for themselves, and we should encourage this as much as possible. But while acknowledging that the Christian faith encourages literacy and has done so historically, we must remember the stats. 70 to 80% of the world's population are oral learners. Now, in God's providence, dealing with oral learners is not a new thing for the Christian church. It's worth noting that just prior to the invention of the Gutenberg Press in 1450, they estimate that the literacy rate in Europe was about 7%. So from the start of the church in Acts 2 to around the year 1500, 
the vast majority of Christians were illiterate. So we can assume that patterns of ministry that emerged in the first millennium or so had to be suitable for oral learning communities. So it's not surprising that the church developed similar patterns to that of its mother faith, Judaism. Judaism, as Simon uh, so well showed us, a religion of the book, working with a majority oral preference community. Oral learners are good at memorising techniques. So what did the church develop? They developed creeds. They developed songs. And both of these were written so that people could remember without reading. They had set liturgies that the same ones repeated week by week so that people who couldn't read could learn them. They developed catechisms so that illiterate people could learn the basics of doctrine. And just as for the Jews, where the basics of the faith were built into their lives through yearly cycles of feasts and sacrifices culminating in the Day of Atonement, so the church developed yearly cycles of feasts and special days, what we call the liturgical calendar, the church calendar. And also, just as the Jewish community had a small number of literate leaders, scribes, priests and kings, who could access the scriptures and keep the community on track, so the Christian community leaders were the ones who were literate. Now, believe it or not, our Anglican prayer book is a great example of an instrument developed by the church to work largely in an oral learning environment. It was written around the rise of literacy in England, but I suggest that the basic pattern set out in the prayer book assumes a largely illiterate congregation. So what did the 1662 prayer book look like? The congregational prayers and responses were well written, and repeated week by week so that people could learn them and participate. The liturgy was bathed in scripture. So as people heard the liturgy every week, critical texts entered into their minds and hearts for good. There was public and systematic reading of scripture. And there was a concentration on the Psalms designed for remembering and singing. And there was a church calendar helping the learners to remember what they had been taught through their daily life. Now, I must say, as we modern literate evangelicals drop all this stuff, it's quite understandable in some ways because we've got direct access to the text and we can read it for ourselves. But when we do things like we change our liturgy every week, we change our creed every week, we change the responses every week, when we change things and don't allow the people to actually know by heart what we're saying, we're making it very hard for oral preference learners. So I suggest we now can learn from history about what was done in the past. We need to be careful, though, as we have our very literate culture, we must be careful not to assume that the way we do it is right for everyone. Some of our strategies for ministry and discipling may not be right for oral learners. Well, lastly, and just quickly, lessons from global mission. Those who critique the Western missionary movement note that for years, missionaries have just imported Western text-based strategies into non-Western oral communities. The missionaries then question themselves, 
why is this discipling process I'm involved in such an uphill battle? And can I say, this is still happening. Western missionaries taking West, Western-based, text-based learning strategies into oral communities. However, the good news is that for some decades, some missionaries have been rectifying these mistakes. They've done much thinking about working with oral cultures. And these missionaries have realised that what oral communities need, what, how their people learn best, is through community, through story, when the teaching is relevant to the daily life. They are making an effort to introduce teaching and learning strategies that are designed for oral communities. One such is Megavoice. We have Megavoice here. They have these brilliant technology to help people access the Word of God by voice. I was just in Madagascar and I saw all these newly planted churches with illiterate young lay people running them and the only teaching they're getting is via their mega voice before Sunday when they go and teach. So much thought is being put into these strategies. So we've covered a lot of information in a short time. We love our Bibles and we want all our believers to love the, God, the Word of God. However, we, want, we must recognise the difference between oral learners and text-based learners and how they each learn. Every Christian community needs access to the scriptures, but the teaching and learning strategies needed to teach people from oral preference backgrounds to access the scriptures through theological education will be different to theological education in text-dominant cultures. And the way Christians are disciples, discipled in oral-majority communities must be different to strategies used in text-based Western cultures. Lastly, I just want you to remember the stats. We must recognise that most communities in the non-Western world are almost entirely oral learners. We must also wake up to the fact that oral learners are on the rise in Western cultures. What does this mean for our ministry? Um, thanks, thanks, Malcolm and Simon. We're going to um, head into the panel time. So we've got the, the code here um, to go to Slido. And I'll just remind you that if you can't think up the question that you wanted to ask, or you don't know how to phrase it, just look on the Slido page. You can see everyone else's questions and you can actually vote for questions. So that was new to me. You can, you can vote. Um, and, those, and that will mean those questions will move to the top. Um, so do you guys want to stand up here while I bring you the first question? Sure. And just remember you can ask Marinka questions as well as a practitioner. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, okay, I'll stand in the middle. Okay, well, probably um, a quick one just to get started. Um, someone has put here a question. Does all that Simon said problematise the norm of doing quiet times? So we're going to throw them out? Sure. <laughs> uh, yes, stop having your quiet time. It's a terrible thing. <laughs> no, of course not. Um, no, what a wonderful blessing to be able to read the Word of God yourself. Um, I tell you what I think is a problem, though, uh, when we speak about quiet times as if that's the baseline Christian activity, because as soon as we do that, we're immediately excluding people who are not able to read the Bible by themselves. Um, and I think we are perhaps... Um, uh, we're, we're imposing our cultural preferences on a, on a mode of uh, hearing the word and of speaking to God that, that is not necessarily something which, um, which enjoys the same 
um, focus in the Bible. So uh, I think I've really enjoyed quiet times at times when instead of reading the Bible by myself, uh, I've met up with somebody who couldn't read and actually spent time reading the Bible with them uh, so that they're hearing the word and we're praying together. Um, that's, that's wonderfully rich. I, I have to say my current community, I don't, I'm not surrounded by quite so many people who struggle with literacy at the moment. That's an occupational hazard, I guess. But, um, uh, but I, I do think that's a, that's a wonderful thing to do. So, so I'm not saying either or. But if we are in the habit of speaking as if that is the baseline Christian activity, um, that, that's going to exclude a large number of adults in Australia, let alone people in other parts of the world where literacy rates are lower. Thanks. OK, we've got, we've got two questions rating pretty highly and they kind of go together. So, um, firstly... Um, should more college be training ministers also to minister to oral preference learners in Australia? And does a lack of such training leave us too educated a church? Okay, think about that question. But also with that, there's a very practical question that's asked, do you have an oral preference friendly method or substitute for weekly Bible studies in a local church context? Okay, I'll do the first one, you do the Bible study one. <laughs> Excellent. Um, uh, so, do we have a problem that, um, that our models of ministry are attracting uh, highly educated people? Uh, I think yes, obviously, and, and that's not a new problem. That's been something that's around for a long time. Can we do better at this? Absolutely, we can do better at this. But it's not that it's, it's never happened or it's not happening now. Um, there, there are things that we do which are actually oral activities but we easily slip into the habit of thinking they're text space. Uh, for instance, the talk that I gave you earlier, was that an exercise in text or an exercise in orality? I can tell you tonight, it was an exercise in text. I, everything I put on the screen for you was text. I, sat, I had a full text that I read to you. So even though I was speaking, it was a text-based activity. But preaching, of course doesn't have to be like that. Um, it, preaching is an oral activity. It's a core activity that we train people for. Uh, and I, uh, I certainly hope that as people are coming through college, uh, they're picking up that this mode of communication is primarily an oral mode of communication. And it's something that's fundamental uh, to the way that we train people for ministry. So can we do it better? Sure, absolutely. Uh, and I think we are at risk in our tribe, and I'm not just talking about Sydney Anglicans, but in the conservative evangelical tribe, uh, we are way overrepresented uh, in terms of people with tertiary education and significantly underrepresented in people who struggle with literacy. So at, at the moment, only around one in four Australian adults has a degree. So how many friends without a degree do you have? Uh, can, I just, can I just add to that as well? Um, I think even as we think about how we're being taught at Moore College, for instance, and how we're ministering to uh, in churches and doing ministry, uh, as in the example I gave with oral preference learners, we need to break this nexus because the natural thing uh, to do is to teach others the way you've been taught yourself. And if we can promote the idea that here at Moore College, we want people to know the Bible as well as possible. And I don't think we should apologise for that. We want to take people and get them to the highest level of biblical literacy. We may have to challenge them, though, when they leave Moore College, not to assume that they're going to use exactly the same techniques that they've been used to be taught to teach others. That will work with some people they're going to minister to, depending on their cohort. But they may well find themselves in a church somewhere in the diocese or in another part of Australia or in another part of the world where those strategies won't work. And they've got to be open, eyes open to the possibility that they're going to find that. Um, 
You can start um, the next one. Oh, yeah, just go to the next question of, um, do you have an oral preference-friendly method or substitute for weekly Bible studies? Um, I could just give a word of mm. experience that we have had at our local church. Um, we've been doing uh, a discovery Bible study method. So it is a Bible study. Um, but what's different about it is that um, the passage is read, everyone listens, and then people take it in turns to repeat back what they've heard, to retell it. Um, and what's been really exciting about that method um, is that even very lit literate people and very, uh, I guess, text-based learners, I guess being their preference, they've recognised that when they are forced to listen and then retell, they actually notice things in the text that they didn't before. Um, and then there's simple five questions that uh, you can... It's the same five questions every week. And mm. so the group gets into the pattern of discussing those questions. It can, they can even be in any order. Um, and I think that's been really helpful for some of our oral preference learners. Mm. Do you guys have any other...? Mm. Uh, not so much Bible study uh, group as such, um, but just a reminder that uh, we're very uh, privileged in our Bible, given to us by the Lord, uh, that text-based learners like analysis, <coughs> oral preference learners like stories. And guess how our Bible, or most of our Bible, is written? Uh, our Bible is written in narrative form, in story, to, in story form. So, in some sense, telling the big story of uh, the Bible, what we call biblical theology, in, in the, the sense of the one big story, is told through lots of little stories about people's lives as God revealed himself to his people. And so, in many senses... Uh, we're very privileged that God didn't give us a Bible which is basically a systematic theology textbook. He gave us a book of stories, which is fantastic for teaching oral people. Thanks, Michael. Um, two things I want to add. Um, one is there, there is in the world of missions, I think, a real overreach in the orality space that um, that can be linked to the story thing. So, uh, so Bible's full of stories but it's not only stories. And if you limit yourself to only looking at the parts that are story, you're actually not going to preach the whole counsel of God either. Uh, and so there is, in the, in the literature around orality, there's a risk um, that you actually um, uh, you make a direct correlation with orality and we're only going to tell stories. Uh, and I think we don't want to rob people of the riches of God's word by doing that. Um, but, uh, yes, we, we tend to do it badly the other way around and turn all the stories into systematic dot points. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to share with you is an experience of mine in a Bible study group. Uh, I know you're not supposed to have favourite children, and uh, I don't. Both of them are here, thank you. Uh, and, uh, and you're not supposed to have favourite Bible study groups either, I'm sure. But my favourite Bible study group was very early on in ministry, uh, it was a group of eight guys um, meeting together. Um, about halfway through the first week, I worked out that only three of the eight of us could read. Everybody had a Bible. They even had the, the ability to turn it up the right way round, but they couldn't actually read it out loud. Um, I, I was with that group for two years, and it was such a huge blessing. Uh, we didn't do it, anything particularly uh, kind of clever, but the first thing I did was, uh, was ditch all the pre-prepared printed notes that I'd have, you know, worked so hard at because that was just a barrier to them. Uh, and although we weren't using exactly the same method that Marinka was talking about, just reading the Bible out and saying, what did you notice? What didn't you get? What's your questions? And so all of the things that I did in preparation, I then shared verbally rather than having written question down uh, which is a pretty contrived way of running a group, really, uh, when you, you've thought of all the questions, you've written all the questions down, then you get someone else to read it out or something like that. Just having a conversation with people and being more relaxed about it. One of the things that struck me was the guys who couldn't read, uh, 
their memory of what we had read before was much sharper than mine was. So I'd got into slack habits of, I knew that if I'd forgotten what that was, I'd just be able to go back and look at it later. And so I, I wasn't actually remembering scripture in the same way that they were. But they had this storehouse of the riches of God's word that they remembered. Uh, so it's, it's like their secret superpower, I guess. Um, so I, I found that group just a huge blessing and encouragement to me just by doing it simpler, um, doing the same prep myself, but engaging in a conversation rather than printing anything out. Okay, the, the next question that uh, we'll ask is, if liturgy is helpful for oral learners, why is it that the, ma that the more liturgical churches I know are the least effective at evangelism, especially in low socioeconomic communities? Um, I think here we have to be careful to define what we mean by uh, a liturgical church. Uh, people have done research on uh, different sorts of church services in different denominations, and basically every denomination is liturgical. Even we all have our set ways of doing it, right? Um, I'm not advocating uh, being somehow we all turn into Anglo-Catholics and we start being liturgical in uh, the sense that, the stereotype sense that we probably react against as evangelicals. But I think the research is saying you need to have well thought out biblical liturgies that are repeated week by week. Uh, we, have, we have our things, but we think what people need is variety. And so we try our best to be as Less for, least formal as possible and have the most variety. But actually what oral learners need is consistency uh, to be able to learn the prayers and be able to participate. So I'm not saying we should become a really liturgical church, but just noting that when we do public worship, that we think it through well. And our prayer book, believe it or not, uh, is a well-thought-through, uh, well-written prayers that are very good for public worship. And if we followed that and did it uh, week by week, oral preference learners would find it easier to participate. That was the point. I'll just stay there. There's a quick one for you. I hope, I think it's quick. Malcolm, can you provide the sources for the stats concerning oral preference learners? I could but not right here on the screen. If you write to me at malcolm.richards at more.edu.au, I will help you. Right. Um, okay. Um, okay, some of these have been answered a little bit. If you don't think it's been answered, just keep liking it or something. Um, <laughs> how do oral cultures promote critical thinking? So I think this is a really curly one. So, um, uh, so what we know of as critical thinking uh, really is, re is quite um, tightly tied uh, to the way that we do um, literacy uh, and to the way that we unpack texts. Um, so a whole range of what uh, we know of as critical thinking has come out of the Enlightenment and is part of a culture that's... Um, that's fostered in a highly literate community. So, um, so good question, but if I could, if I could ask a, a question I'd rather answer, uh, it would be something more like, um, what kind of thinking are Christians commended to do in the Bible? Um, and, and I think, can we, can we um, encourage people who are orant, oral preference learners to be engaging in God's word, to be meditating on the word of God, cogitating on it, uh, to be carefully examining it in the way that the Bereans were. Are there ways that we can do that? Um, yes. So I think the basis of it is, is knowing. So you build off knowing so there, there could be memorisation, um, comprehension. You can do all of that quite easily orally. 
The next bit is about, um, about the implications, thinking through, well, how does that fit with other things? And I think for a lot of oral preference learners, there's a whole bunch of other learning uh, kind of categories that go in there. But Malcolm talked about making sure that the, the information that we're getting is engaging with the issues that people are struggling with, that they can see an outcome, that there's a purpose for what they're learning. So I think helping people draw together, if this is true about Jesus and Jesus is the Son of God, what does that mean about the Trinity? You can do that orally. It's going to look and feel quite different, uh, but, but that might help people to think profoundly about the Trinity um, in, in a way that you could also do perhaps much more easily with a text. So I think it's difficult, but it's critical thinking I don't think is the goal. I mean, let, let's think about what is the kind of thinking that Christian people are commended to uh, in the Bible. And it's so, it looks a bit like critical thinking, but um, I don't think it's as critical and I think it's actually uh, far more submissive. Um, so let's commend that kind of thing. Can I just uh, add, add a slightly different uh, point? And that is uh, some of the research about critical thinking is saying that there is no broad category called critical thinking that critical thinking is actually domain-specific. So we, in our text-based culture, uh, we like to define critical thinking as the way to think critically about text. And so when we see uh, oral learners, uh, we say, well, they're not thinking critically because they're not thinking critically like us. But you'll find many people in traditional uh, farming communities can think very critically about farming, about when to plant their crops, what went wrong, what they have to do next time. Uh, they problem solve in their own domain about their whole life. Uh, but we don't define that as critical thinking because they're not using the text-based skills that we refer to as critical thinking. But in their own domains of life, they are thinking critically and problem solving. Yeah. Okay. Um, someone's observe, observing that oral preference learners gravitate towards parables and Old Testament narrative and imagery, while text preference learners focus on texts like Romans and Hebrews. Um, I think you touched on this before about the preference of stories, but. I, I just wanted to make uh, one observation, and that is, if we are correct that in the New Testament time, uh, let's say 95% of people were illiterate, uh, that means that when Paul wrote Romans to the Roman church, uh, he was writing to a church that was 95% illiterate. Uh, and yet he still expected the church in Rome to not only be taught what was in his letter, but for them to understand uh, the theological concepts and his whole argument. So that says to me that uh, from the beginning of the Christian church, uh, when the vast majority of people were oral learners, uh, the people that wrote the scriptures, the apostles, assumed that these oral learners were not only rehearsing uh, those letters that they were being given, uh, there were people in those churches who were the teachers in those churches teaching the rest of the people, but they must have been teaching in a way to explain Paul's letters to the oral learners. So, yes, we tend to think that uh, oral preference people tend towards story and away from epistle, but I would say that that is not the intention uh, or the expectation in the early church. Okay, so um, is oral preference learning more than just a learning style? Uh, someone here says, learning styles have largely been debunked in the education scene. For type 2 oral preference learners, why should we engage orally as opposed to text? Um, okay, Malcolm and I actually talked about this, and I, uh, 
um, made this point, the learning style thing, like the visual auditory kinesthetic thing, um, uh, that's not actually, that's not the same thing as what Malcolm's talking about. So it's not, uh, it's not simply that I prefer, but how does a person make meaning? Um, so there is a capacity question that's not about, uh, I prefer, not simply about, I prefer to take information in, in a particular way, um, but uh, do, do I have a capacity um, yeah, to make meaning out of information that's gleaned in one way or another? Uh, so I, I think this is, this is absolutely worth interrogating further. I think it's really clear uh, if a person is unable to read, then they're unable to get meaning from text. Um, but the, the further along you go into the type two, the, second, the secondary category, uh, I think for some of those people, and certainly for all of the leaders that Malcolm's talking about with the Bible Basics course, whatever their preference is... Um, we want them with the Word of God in a written form in front of them that they can engage in that in order to be well-equipped um, for leading God's people. Uh, and so I think, particularly if you're talking about leaders, um, I've, I've got a different set of standards because I think, as a, a, well, as you've already heard, if you go through the Old and New Testament, I think leaders were held to different expectations with regard to the written Word of God. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything else about that. Um, I just want to tell a story. Uh, and that is, uh, at the Bible school we were teaching in in Congo, uh, we made the decision to aim the course uh, at people who'd done four years of high school minimum and were formally literate. We thought they had the best opportunity for people in those communities to be able to learn how to read the Word of God. As, as we got them together at the beginning of the course, uh, each one of them could read out loud, but when we interrogated them about a small passage, none of them could do any comprehension questions about the passage. So our first job for the whole of our first year of the course was getting people from being formally literate but unable to extract any meaning from the text to by the end of the, the first year, hopefully, being able to basically do comprehension in a text. So when we, when we talk about preference, as Simon said, we've got to be very careful not to uh, use that word in the, in the sense of, oh, I just prefer. Uh, it is a preference for them because they just can't do the other thing. Uh, they are, they are not, many people in, in oral-based communities, they just don't get meaning out of, uh, out of text. Um. Okay, this one shot to the top. Um, according to a recent study by Pew Research, the most effective strategy to grow spiritual maturity is to increase spiritual literacy skills. What are your thoughts? Uh, Pew Research is a wonderful American uh, group. It doesn't surprise me that if you do a study like this in America, uh, that actually the literacy uh, figure is going to be high. That makes perfect sense to me. What grows people to be mature? It's knowing God. Uh, how are they going to come to know God? They come to know God through his word. Uh, so the question really is, how are people going to be able to engage with the word of God uh, and not just hear it, but be hearers and doers of the word, to be transformed by the word. Uh, that's the thing. And if people are in, in literate context where it's possible for them to do that, it doesn't at all surprise me that that's the result of the, the Pew Research um, Survey. And, I mean, as Malcolm said, this is why missions started schools everywhere. This is why literacy follows the gospel everywhere. Because if you know that God has given you a written word and you could possibly get to understand it, well, people are highly motivated uh, and literacy and maturity go together, sure. And even if that's true, uh, we, all, we all want to encourage people to access the Word of God if they can, to themselves. But if it's true that 70% or 80% of the world are oral learners and a large number of those are primary 
oral learners, i.e. their literacy isn't good enough to access the text, are we saying that that many people in the world we're just going to assign to never being mature Christians? Uh, I think that is... I think we can do better than that as a church. So, yes, reading the Bible yourself is great. Uh, but that means also that we as Christian leaders have to be working hard to think how to uh, help oral learners to mature as Christians and how we're going to help them to access the Word of God, but not in text form the way we study it. So I found a question I want to answer. (laughs) So let me do that. (laughs) Um, uh, Somebody's asked a question about models of preaching uh, for where you might have low levels of literacy. Uh, So just a couple of things that I'm conscious of. Um, Often when we preach, if we're used to preaching to people who have their Bibles open in front of them and we expect everybody uh, to be reading their Bibles... We say, do you see in verse 7? Do you see here? Did you notice? Did you see when? Uh, It's a simple shift to ask people if they heard. Did you hear when I said? Did you hear when Peter said? Did you hear how Jesus replied? So speaking about what people heard um, signals to people that even if they didn't read this words for them. Uh, And another thing is just in the way... So I mentioned about preaching being an oral form of communication. I think if, if an oral form is done well, all of the signalling, I haven't got my notes here, but on my notes, my headings are in bold, they're large, that makes sense in text, right? And they're numbered and I, I put them on the overhead. It's all text. Orally, you have to be able to signal structure verbally. It's just a different way of communicating. Um, and and you'll, you use repetition and you make sure you use exactly the same words because people are trying to catch them on the way past. So it's just a different way of communicating. Uh, but if you're used to preaching in, in places where uh, there's a large number of people who are not readers, um, hopefully, as you chat to them before and after church and those things, you, you get this kind of feedback from people like, I lost you. How many points did you have? What was that about? I could. Who was talking at that point? We need to signal all of those things orally. So I think that's that's one of the key differences. Sure. Uh, this a lot more really good questions, but we have come to our time of closing. Um, I, I don't know. Does Slido just stay open like this? Is there a way to get the questions and keep talking about them? We, we might. Uh, we might. Tech download, person can do download that. Download them and uh, yeah. answer them in text. Yeah, I think even uh, just <laughs> keep talking about these with the people in your church and who you're doing ministry with. I think is great. Um, I'm going to close. Uh, thank you to everyone who's watching online. I believe there's a lot more people online than here, so that's exciting. Uh, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your great love to us, Lord, that you would reveal yourself in your son Jesus and through your word. Lord, please give us your love for the people who are around us. Lord, please show us our blind spots, show us our assumptions. And Lord, please help us to be humble as we keep seeking to share your good plans for this whole world and for each person with the people around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.